plant feeding insects don't have a pancreas. They can't digest sugar. And depending on the insect above or below the ground that's detrimental to the plant, 12, 13, 14 bricks of sugar will normally be enough sugar that when that plant feeding insect eats it without a pancreas, that sugar will ferment, turn to alcohol, and kill the insect, nature's own insecticide. Insects do not have very good digestive systems. Stuff has to come in digested to them because they cannot digest things. They just don't have the enzymes. They're garbage collectors. They eat muck. They eat garbage. They eat bad stuff. They eat stuff that we don't want to eat. Take a look at cockroaches, for example. There are many other examples. Uh, fruit flies, they're always around decaying fruit. They're not around healthy fruit. Avocados, apples, guava, and citrus, this pest known as the Mexican fruit fly, invades more than 40 types of fruits and nuts. A recent test confirms they're in the valley once again. So the relationship between codling moth and navel orange worm in walnuts particularly, a lot of the production in walnuts and a lot of the research has been in northern uh, California and uh, typically, uh, traditionally, navel orange worm has been thought of as a secondary pest that uh, comes in after, uh, you know, to do injuries, typically to injuries that uh, are caused by codling moth that can come in through other things such as walnut blight. But, uh, so basically, it's been considered that if you controlled walnut blight and you controlled codling moth, then your control of navel orange worm is sufficient. And uh, I think there's been a couple of situations where that kind of has uh, fallen down and proven not to be uh, good or sufficient. So you've got these insects that are keying in on very specific uh, plants or even, let's say, the fruiting structures like a tomato, and that's what they are, uh, they are, uh, they are keying in on. Insects are only tuned in to the unhealthy plant. No insect will ever attack a healthy plant. So what they're zooming in on is the unhealthy plant because it's digestible. Uh, healthy plants are not digestible. Unhealthy plants are. So because they can't digest a healthy plant, there, there's, there's no interest in even attacking it. Evolutionarily, Taxonomic class Insecta are crustaceans that colonize land, though many major orders still require aquatic environments to complete their life cycle. Insect ancestors are supposedly detrivores, and that feeding on waste and other decaying organic matter, much of which was plant life, required enzymes that process plant cell structures. Even half a billion years ago, in the beginning of the Paleozoic era, Ancestral insect orders like the Plecoptera, Phasmatodea, Dictoptera, Hemiptera, and Coleoptera already had preliminary ability to break down early land plant tissues. Feeding on decaying plant life facilitated the interaction between insects and certain fungi, bacteria, and viruses, and played a role in the development of more sophisticated herbivorous insects through symbiotic relationships that bestowed increased capability to process plant tissues and even suppress plant immune defenses. The class Insecta is the most diverse group of animals. It is estimated that over 90% of animals are insects, with the beetles of order Coleoptera and the wasps and their derivatives in Hymenoptera historically vying for the status of most diverse order. The defining characteristic of most insects is the development of powered flight using wings. They are the first organisms to develop winged flight, and those that have are called the Neoptera, of which there are three main lines of evolution. The Polyneoptera, the Condylonatha, and the Holometabola, the last of which contains approximately 86% of insect species. This success is attributed to their complete metamorphosis, which allows larvae and adults to occupy different ecological niches that don't directly compete. Within these three lines is an extremely diverse group of dietary requirements, even within the herbivorous populations. Beetles, wasps, flies, and moths are the groups that contain the most species, and a combination of adapting shorter lifespans and larger rates of food consumption and growth is also thought to have led to greater success. Carbohydrates are considered the most common source of energy utilized by insects and are also used in the synthesis of fats and glycogen. Some carbohydrates cannot be digested by insects, 
and the lack of certain enzymes prevent some insect species from using certain celluloses, starches, and polysaccharides. For example, larval cabbage butterfly Piera brassici can use starch in its diet. Larval small tortoiseshell butterflies cannot. Yet, neither species can use cellulose nor hemicellulose. Despite this, the larvae are able to consume these substances and can digest the internal parts of plant cells while efficiently excreting undigestible carbohydrates. Knowing what kinds of carbohydrates are present and to what degree in various plant tissues, as well as the specific feeding tendencies of certain herbivorous insects, may provide some level of predictive ability as to what might be a suitable plant for a hypothetical species. Feeding mouthparts inform insect diet and adaptations to that end. There are five main types of mouthparts. The ancestral feeding mouthparts are for chewing plant tissue, from which lapping, siphoning, sponging, and sucking mouthparts derive. These mouthparts are fundamental to several insect families and are important for identification. From an integrated pest management perspective, it is indolent to talk about insect physiology in too general a context without making extreme concessions that overlook important details. The herbivory, general physiology, an ecological niche of a honeybee, western flower thrips, and rice root aphid are dramatically different and contrast this difference well. It would be a bit anthropocentric to say something like, Plant feeding insects don't have a pancreas. They can't digest sugar. Or, Insects do not have very good digestive systems. Stuff has to come in digested to them because they cannot digest things. They just don't have the enzyme. And it would also be misleading since insects and other arthropods possess adaptations for feeding on plants and their sugars that predate mammalian herbivory by about 200 million years. While they do not have a pancreas like vertebrates, insects do generally have a foregut, midgut, and hindgut, and a special semi-permeable structure, or analog, called a peritrophic matrix that compartmentalizes a group of food particles, called a bolus, concentrating digestive enzymes like amylases, glucosidases, and invertases to break down sugars, cellulases, and pectinases to break down plant cell structure, lipases and esterases for lipids, as well as peptides and proteases to break down proteins. There are pores in the matrix that allow only small molecules through and limit the potential for certain pathogens to infect the general digestive tract. Some diets are mostly solid, while other diets are mostly liquid, but much as it is like for plants. There are pathogens and compounds that can stress, damage, or kill an insect, depending on the circumstance. Some of the most well-studied insect herbivores belong to the order Hemiptera, a lineage that predates flowering plants that make up the vast majority of cultivated crops. Although plant sugars found in the sieve elements of phloem sap channels are important for sap feeding Hemiptera, like the pestiferous aphids, whiteflies, and scale insects, these groups rely on the internal turgor pressure to move the sap through their digestive tract, and highly specialized bacterial symbionts in special vesicles called bacteriosomes to process the sugars and amino acids commonly excreting a large proportion of this sap as a sugary concentrate called honeydew. Because sap has plentiful sugars in water, but low levels of other important nutrients, they must process a large amount in aggregate to sustain their dietary needs, oftentimes consuming their body weight in phloem multiple times per day. Aphids in particular have a filter chamber in their foregut and synthesize oligosaccharides from sucrose by breaking it down efficiently, both of which are adaptations that keep the osmotic pressure between sugar and water at a suitable, non-toxic level. These adaptations are hundreds of millions of years old and are important for a diet of plants with high BRICS levels, a measurement of dissolved sugars in plant tissue that is a useful tool in assessing the physiology of a plant. Proteins, amino acids, 
lipids, minerals, and vitamins can be supplied to other herbivorous insects by feeding on pollen, seed, stem, leaf, root, and flower tissue. Microbial symbionts can also supplement some of these compounds or aid in their processing. In addition to all these nutrients, the dependence on high amounts of water has not disappeared for most insects and general terrestrial insect physiology is developed to conserve water to a high degree. It is not uncommon for one stage of an insect, especially one of the many herbivorous holometabola, to require a vastly different diet than another. For example, larval European corn borer moths require a low sugar, high protein diet in the early stages, a proportion that gradually inverts as the larva grows, and like many moths, adults require a high sugar diet. Plants that have harmful imbalances of nutrients can stymie or completely halt the development of certain herbivorous insect species while being suitable to others. Sometimes, cultivars of various crop species have minor or major traits that make them less suitable than relatives, such as through the increased production of an insecticidal metabolite or being receptive to an endophytic microbe that colonizes the plant's tissue and may poison or infect herbivorous insects like the commercially available Bouveria bassiana. Several biopesticidal agents are living microbes or their byproducts and rely on ingestion or contact with the insect pest. Often, these microbes and their metabolites are targeted in efficacy, but some are more broadly capable of infection. Interactions between plants and their insect herbivores can, in this way, be modulated by microbes that associate with the host plant, some of which are pathogens vectored by insects. In many cases, Vectored plant pathogens can have negative effects on the insect vector itself individually, like how tomato yellow leaf virus causes neurodegeneration in its silverleaf whitefly host to help it spread to non-infected plants, or positive effects, like in the case of the generalist navel orangeworm moth, the larvae of which are benefited by aspergillus infections in the fruit of other host plants adapted to processing their mycotoxins like aflatoxins and consuming the fungus in tandem while dispersing it through wounds. Some insects sustain lethal or sublethal damage through ingesting toxic or physically disruptive defense compounds like pyrethrin or latex, as well as from viral or fungal infection brought about from feeding on colonized plant tissue. Often, multiple stressors can impact an individual with synergistic effect, such as ultraviolet irradiation by natural sunlight, hyperthermia by temperature, toxic ingestion, and pathogen infection. Insect herbivores narrowly or broadly specialize in their adaptations to host plants. Through coevolution and through literally hundreds of millions of years, insects have followed land plants from their origins to modernity. For some insects, a plant's endogenous immune response, including their physical structure, is enough to make it totally or mostly unsuitable, especially if the insect lacks specialized adaptations to mitigate these factors. Insect resistance is a spectrum predicated on physiological and environmental contexts, with some herbivorous insects having a dual ecological role that is both parasitic and mutualistic to a plant species. A typical land plant that obtains enough nutrients and sugars to reproduce is considered fit in nature, even if much of the leaves and fruit are damaged in the process or the plant is mortally affected. While natural defenses may allow an individual or population to reproduce in a natural setting and context, cultivated plants are raised within a cosmetic physiological and spatial standard, particularly if for the human consumption. This agricultural discrepancy is integral to understanding insect herbivory in relation to cultivated plants through the layered 
multi-domain pest management context that is integrated across multiple disciplines of natural and social sciences. For most human cultivation standards, natural defenses of even vibrantly healthy crops, however healthiness is quantified contextually, do not protect populations adequately in no small part because key facets of plant natural defense context like individual spacing, concentration of pathogens, herbivore pressure, mutualist presence, biogeographic location, microbiome composition, nutrient balance, resistance and susceptibility genes, secondary metabolite production, hydration, humidity, and temperature are not present in the same fashion and can't be facilitated to some degree. Despite this concession, facilitating the healthiest plant possible will confer benefits against insect herbivores. And lastly, I'd like to bring your attention to this 1996 research article by the Organic Farming Research Foundation entitled Leaf Sap Bricks and Leaf Hoppers in Vineyards. One of the passages reads that in 1991, around the time of developing plans for our irrigation studies, we learned that some organic agriculture consultants in California were promoting the use of BRICS readings from leaf sap as a way of predicting potential leafhopper problems. According to the story being promoted, low BRICS levels would indicate leafhopper danger, while high BRICS levels would mean the plant is well protected against sucking insects. In fact, the 1993-94 issue of the Peaceful Valley Farm Supply Main Catalog stated that, quote, a BRICS reading above 12 indicates plant resistance to sucking insects. In the Natural Pest Management section of the main catalog, the reader was further assured that, quote, you can specifically discourage sucking insects in certain crops by building up plant bricks sugar content to the point that the plant sap is too thick for the insects to extract easily. Another passage reads that, Additional enthusiasm for the BRICS leafhopper story came from an information sheet developed by organic ag advisors, including tips for using the refractometer to measure plant bricks. In this how-to sheet, it was offered that, quote, there is a definite and significant relationship between the plant bricks and its attractiveness to sucking insects. This phenomena has been personally verified for the following insects aphids, spider mites, leafhoppers, and five others. Putting aside the fact that spider mites are in a totally different group than insects, the findings of the research report did not seem to support the points made in the passages. Another passage reads that these preliminary findings began to discount the BRICS leafhopper story. There appeared to be virtually no empirical evidence to support this alleged BRICS leafhopper relationship. Thus, in 1994, we initiated a two-year field study for the potential of an inverse, predictive relationship between leaf sap BRICS levels and erythroneura leafhopper densities in San Joaquin Valley grape vineyards. Our primary objective was to rigorously evaluate the contention that high BRICS levels in leaf sap, greater than 12, would lead to low leafhopper densities, while low BRICS values would be associated with high leafhopper numbers in vineyards. In the conclusion sections of the report, the authors mentioned that results compiled during this rigorous two-year empirical study of eight San Joaquin Valley vineyards, including five organic operations, provide no consistent support for the alleged predictive BRICS leafhopper relationship as it has been widely promoted in recent years. In only two of the eight vineyard field sites, figures two and five, were data patterns even moderately similar to those expected from the story. More importantly, data patterns from the other six vineyard sites were either in direct opposition, figures one, three, four, and eight, or essentially neutral, figures six and seven, with respect to the alleged BRICS leafhopper relationship. Although most farmers, agricultural consultants, and even academic researchers are beginning to recognize that grapevine nutritional status can certainly affect the population dynamics of leafhoppers and other pests, available evidence that leaf sap bricks levels alone 
can be used to reliably predict herbivore population changes is clearly less than compelling. Perhaps noteworthy is the fact that the 1996-97 Peaceful Valley Farm Supply main catalog suggested simply that, quote, plants with a high bricks reading above 12 sugar content also have good immune systems, end quote. This statement is appropriately more cautious than the 1993-94 main catalog's broad assurance that, quote, a bricks reading above 12 indicates plant resistance to sucking insects. And it's true, it's clear to see from the figures that as the bricks content increased in these vineyards, the leafhopper population also increased, and when the bricks levels decreased, the leafhopper population was unaffected. It didn't increase necessarily. 